Good morning, everybody, and welcome to DC Church. My name is Jason Nye. Would you stand with us? And we're going to worship our King this morning. We're going to sing, At Your Name, Lord. The glory is for you and you alone, Father. This is why we're here. At your name, the mountains shake and crumble. At your name, the oceans roar and tumble At your name Angels will bow The earth will rejoice Your people cry out Lord of all the earth We shout your name Shout your name Filling up the skies With endless praise in this praise Yahweh, Yahweh We love to shout your name Oh Lord That's right, we shout your name Lord At your name The morning The morning breaks in glory At your name At your name Creation sings your story at your name angels will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out come on lord of all the earth we shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Shout your name, O oh Lord. And there is no one like our God, so we will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing. We will sing, there is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you, Jesus, you are God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, we shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise, Yahweh. Yes, Lord, that's why we've come. We've come to shout your name. You are Yahweh. You are the beginning. You are the end. God, you are worthy of our praise, no matter of our circumstances. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. In every valley, he has been faithful to provide. And even in shadows, he scatters darkness with his light. Yes, you do, Lord. You scatter the darkness. We trust you. We love you. In every season, he has sustained me with his word. And like a good shepherd, he leads me steady and secure. Look what God has done He's been here all along All through the changing of the tides He's been constant, He's been kind Whoa, look what God has done His love 
love surrounding us all through the fire and the flood he's always been enough he's been enough so let's build an altar worship together and bow down of his wonders let all of heaven hear the sound oh look what god has done he's been here all along all through the changing of the tides he's been constant he's been kind whoa look what god has done his love surrounding us all through the fire and the flood He's always been enough, he's been enough. That's right, he's been enough. And there is no name that's greater, greater. The one who saves, he reigns forever. There is no name that's greater, greater. The one who saves, he reigns forever. Jesus, his name is Jesus. Oh, look what God has done. He's been here all along, all through the changing of the tides. He's been constant, he's been kind. Oh, look what God has done. His love surrounding us, all through the fire and the flood. He's always been enough, he's been going to continue to worship and as you can see and as you know it's starting to change outside we are approaching the Christmas season as we celebrate the birth of Jesus so let's sing hark the herald angels sing this morning okay Jesus we love you we praise you we thank you we give you the praise and the honor and the glory that's due your name yes Lord And hark the herald angels sing Glory to the newborn King Peace on earth and mercy mild God and sinners reconciled Joyful all ye nations rise Join the triumph of the skies with angelic hosts proclaim Christ is born in Bethlehem hark the herald angels sing glory to the new born My highest heaven adored Christ the everlasting Lord Late in time behold him come Offspring of the virgin's womb Failed in flesh the God at sea Jesus our Emmanuel, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn King. It's glory 
to you the King, Lord. So hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all He brings. Risen with healing in His wings. Mild He lays His glory by, born that man no more may die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give Him second birth. give it up for the Lord this morning. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We've come to the time now we're taking communion. Uh, many of you already have your cups. If you don't at this time, you can go over and grab one. We'll also have one coming around to give you a cup if you're not able to get up. Um, for some reason, Christmas just really, really grabs at the hearts of people who may not even be Christians, number one, but wouldn't go to church either. And so Christmas has this kind of ubiquitous quality and culture in the West, in America especially. My wife asked me every weekend to watch one Hallmark movie with her, so uh, I'm not immune to this either in my household. But what's, what's so interesting about Christmas, though, is that we oftentimes, we, we break it off from Easter. We break it off from the core Christian message, the kerygma. And the truth is that the birth story of Jesus at Christmas actually points to the Easter story and the cross and the empty tomb. You see, Jesus, he, although from Nazareth, was born in Bethlehem. And the priests in Jerusalem, they needed many animals to make offerings at the temple, and they raised their flocks in and around Bethlehem. You see, Jesus came into this world, and he came into this world with animals in a stable, right? He was actually was laid in a manger, a trough where animals eat, and he was wrapped in a swaddling clothes. Now, what makes swaddling clothes, right? Well, what makes them is you, the user, using the cloths to swaddle a baby, to wrap them up tight so they are comfortable and warm. But really the cloths that would have been used would have mirrored when a lamb came into the world, when a lamb was young. They would have weak legs and they would thrash about when they come out of the womb. And this thrashing can cause the legs to break and the animal to be, to, to be hurt to not be able to be used and raised. And so they were wrapped in these long cloths to bind their legs to their body, to keep them from thrashing about. Jesus was born like a livestock. He came into the world wrapped in swaddling clothes, just like a newborn lamb would be wrapped to keep them from thrashing about. Jesus is this great and lasting offering in the temple on behalf of our sins. So because of Jesus, because of Christmas, there are no more need for offerings. There's no more need for priests. We have a great high priest, one who can stand between us and God, mediating, making sure by what he did for us that there is no question that you nor I can have a relationship with God because of who he is and what he did for us. So as we take this holy meal, as you unwrap the bread, our Lord tells us, that the, the, the bread here is his body, his flesh, broken on the cross for us. And as we, um, we take the juice here, the fruit of the vine, 
Jesus told us that this here is his blood poured out on our behalf, the blood of the covenant, a new covenant between us and our creator. Let's pray. Lord God, you are holy and just and mighty in all of your ways. And the fact is, you are different from us. You were so much unlike us. The only way we could ever know you is for you to reach out in the ways you created the universe, the world, the way you've made us, and most importantly, how you've revealed yourself through Jesus Christ in Scripture. If you didn't speak, if you didn't act, we could never know you, and yet you have. And the fundamental truths are that we've got a sin problem. We can't really know you, and we are under your wrath and punishment. But by Jesus Christ, by the Christmas story and the Easter story, we can have a relationship with you. We thank you for the blood of the new covenant. We thank you for Christmas and for the birth of Jesus. May we live up to this calling you've placed in us by Jesus Christ. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, I'm so glad to see all of you. Now, we are uh, uh, transitioning to a more normal schedule, not back to being normal, but we're moving that direction. But we're trying to, to, to follow all the rules for how to do this safely, deal with the virus safely. So remember now, uh, you come in one door, you leave by another. So you came in this side, you leave by this side, you go out that exterior door. By the way, all the doors are cleaned regularly during the morning so that if you touch a door, you know it's, it's clean. And uh, we are setting every other pew, and we're trying to keep family unions only on any particular uh, row of chairs. I said pew, old-fashioned talk, row of chairs you're sitting in. Um, we had a really good crowd at the early service. In fact, we were close to what our capacity is, which is 250. That's our capacity. We might have to add another service. I don't know. Uh, I'd like to add another service, although you knew who's going to be going to be preaching that service, right? Me. And I don't get overtime, so I don't know. We'll see. So anyway, um, wear your mask, stay safe, okay? Now, uh, we have Christmas Sunday services on December 20th. We are going to have, this is our tradition, all of our Christmas activities, all of our service, all the celebration of Christmas on that day. It's usually one of the highest attendance days of the year. Of course, we're in the virus right now. So whether you're watching online or you're here, here live at the West Portsmouth campus, hey, West, hello, West Portsmouth. Uh, remember, that's our day we're celebrating, okay? Now, every year we have a Thanksgiving offering, and we do that to help bridge the gap we have in the year between what our income is and what our needs are uh, budget-wise. Well, this year we didn't have a Thanksgiving offering. We are, we've been going through the virus, and you've been giving very generously despite the virus. Our ministry is smaller because of the virus. And so we're doing well financially. That's good, and I want to thank you for that. So what I'm asking you to do is, not having a Thanksgiving offering, what I'm asking you to do is to give what you were giving to the Thanksgiving offering, add it to what you give the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And by the way, next Sunday is the annual mission sermon, so I want to tell you about that, so make sure you're here for that. But anyway, give what you were giving to the Thanksgiving offering to the Lottie Moon offering. Let me tell you what's, what's important. Our missionaries, over 6,000 international missionaries Southern Baptists have, their salaries are paid for by our Southern Baptist Convention through what we call the cooperative program. That's what each church decides to give. We give about 6 or 7% of our budget to the cooperative program. And that pays their salaries. But all the things they do in the, in the mission field is done through the Lottie Moon Offering. So the hospitals, the, the farms, the medicine, the churches that are planted, we plant many churches overseas every year. All the costs of the, of the work of our missionaries overseas comes from this offering. And this year, because of the virus, we may fall 60 or 70 or $80 million short. And we don't like that, do we? Now, not, not every church can help because many of them aren't even meeting, but we can help. So we give you an offering to that. Are you getting this? Are you alive? I can hear some breathing. Some of you I don't know about, but most of you are alive. So make sure you give uh, the Lottie Moon offering in a few weeks and give the very best you can to it, okay? The Nativity Experience starts this week. We just had the Christmas market at West Portsmouth. That was wonderful. 
And then this week we have the Nativity Experience. It's, um, let's see, it's, it's, it's Friday, Saturday, Sunday, right? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. I don't even know. I'm going to show up and be anybody here. I'll say, what happened? <laughs> Looking now at 2 Timothy chapter number 2, beginning with verse 14. We're going to read down into verse number 17. And I'm going to read it from the NIV and also from the message. And I read it from the message for a particular purpose, not only because it's clear, but I'm going to reference it in the time I'm speaking to you in a few minutes. So here we are in 2 Timothy chapter 2, beginning with verse 14. Keep reminding God's people of these things. Let me stop now. In the first two chapters of, of 2 Timothy, Paul makes some great theological statements. For example, there's only one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. It's a powerful theological statement. Theology is when we talk about God, the way we think about God. So keep reminding people in a positive way what the theology is about Jesus. Warn them before God against quarreling about words. It is no value and only ruins those who listen. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. Avoid godless chatter because those who indulge in it will become more and more ungodly. Their teaching will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Now, I'm not going to be talking about Hymenaeus or Philetus today. I just want to say their names. just want to say, you know. I told my wife our next kid would be named Hymenaeus. She said, don't even think about it, Ernie. Let me read to you the message. Repeat, repeat these basic essentials over and over to God's people. Warn them before God against pious nitpicking, which chips away at the faith. It just wears everyone out. Concentrate on doing your best for God. Work you won't be ashamed of. Laying out the truth, plain and simple. Stay clear of pious talk that is only talk. Words are not mere words, you know, if they are not backed by godly life. They accumulate as poison in the soul. Hymenaeus and Philetus are examples. Don't fight with other Christians. And that's a general principle. There are times to fight for things in the faith. Now, I'm not talking about those times now. I can't talk about everything. I don't have that long in this message to talk about everything, but I'm going to talk about just one thing. Generally speaking, don't fight with other Christians. And what was happening in Timothy's churches, what Paul was talking about, were people coming in from other places, teaching false doctrine, teaching things that ought not be believed. And Paul says, rather than fight with these people, or rather than encouraging them in their nitpicking about what you teach. Instead, you concentrate on the truth. You be positive in what you do, what you say. You put the truth out there. You trust God and the Holy Spirit to make that truth plain. Don't fight with these other people. In fact, what happens when you fight is you get involved in things which are useless and don't really build up God's church. Jesus himself talked about this. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 9, and Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, we read the same event. There was a man who was casting out demons in Jesus' name. And the disciples came to Jesus and said, Jesus, this guy is casting out demons in your name. He doesn't belong to our denomination. He doesn't uh, have the stamp of approval on him. You've got to stop him. And Jesus said one of the most interesting and important things he ever said. He said, listen, if they're not against us, they're for us. So what our Lord was recommending was, rather than fight with those people who may agree about most things with you, about the most important things, the central things with you, rather than fight with them, recognize they're not against you, they're really for you. So you may disagree with, with another believer about the Holy Spirit and his ministry. You may disagree about uh, topical preaching versus expository preaching, and you might not even care about the difference between those two things. You may disagree with a, a believer about election versus free will. You may disagree about all kinds of things. But if you have the main thing, that Jesus Christ is the only mediator between God and man, then they are on your side. 
They're fighting with you. I listen to all kinds of preaching. I love preaching. You know, like you, I don't get a chance to hear enough good preaching. And one of my favorite preachers is a Seventh-day Adventist African-American who's 25 years younger than me. We have different life experience. We come from a different, things from a different direction. He and I are never going to agree about Seventh-day worship. Never. But I can't get enough of his preaching because I love to hear him talk. And we agree about the main thing, which is Jesus Christ, God's Son who died for us on the cross so our sins could be forgiven. We spend too much time fighting with people who we only disagree about minor things with. I became a pastor in 1979. That was 41 years ago. It's hard to believe that, isn't it? I was a child prodigy. <laughs> the entire time that I've been a pastor, 1979 was a year that the fight began in our denomination, Southern Baptist Convention. That was the year it began. We have been fighting for 41 years. Now, I'm not saying that the issues we were arguing about weren't important issues, but I am saying this. In the last 15 years, we have lost over a million and a half people in unworship attendance. Where's the fighting gotten us? We've taken our eyes off the central issue of the Christian faith, who Jesus Christ is and what he can do, and instead wasted our passions and our efforts and our strength in something that really amounts to nitpicking, as the message says, over very minor issues. Now, when I entered into uh, uh, being a pastor, now I started in 79, but I became a youth pastor in 1972. I know it's hard to believe, isn't it? Look how young I look. I know it's hard to believe. But one of my mentors, one of my fathers in the faith, pastored a good-sized church of five, 600 people in worship. We had two services Sunday morning. The worship center was packed. We had to knock a, a wall down and make overflow space. But he thought that his responsibility was to root out those people in the church who weren't serious about their faith. And the ones he thought weren't serious about their faith was the ones that disagreed with him. And he, I heard him talk to a fellow pastor one day. He said, yes, I'm working on eliminating all the bad wood and the dead wood. And so he took his church, he grew his church, follow my language here, he grew his church while he was pastor from 600 to 200. <laughs> and he was happy about it. He was glad because he was making his church serious about the gospel. Now, I don't, I don't think that way. I want my church to grow. And I can accept that there are people who don't agree with me about certain things. Even the direction of the church, I can accept that. Because what I want, I want to see more people coming to Lord Jesus, more people coming on Sunday morning. I want to see more people, whether in a chair or watching online. That's what I want to see. And I don't think that we are more successful by driving people away because we end up with the ones that are really serious about the faith. Here's what my mentor needed to understand. If you see every problem as a nail, the only tool you have is a hammer. And that's what he was, a human hammer. Now, what, what if you're not fighting with people, but they want to fight with you? What do you do? Now, this happened to me, you know, uh, 30 years ago, I became pastor of, of uh, D.C. Church. I, I've talked about it a lot. For me, it's kind of like confession time. It's cathartic. I'm emptying it out, you know, I'm talking about it. I feel like, or well, I think that we should get benefit from what happened to me, the bad experiences I've had, so we can, get, we can grow because of it. But, uh, you know, we had a lot of controversy over the growth of the church and over relocation, that sort of thing. And one of our, our principal leaders despised me. And I never said an unkind word to him. I never did anything to him. But I was a symbol of change and of growth and of the future. Every time I got up to preach, like King Hezekiah, he would turn his face to the wall. Now, I'm speaking literally. He would actually turn in the pew and face the wall. So he wouldn't have to look at me. 
you know, this is not the way Christ wants things to be. So I took the initiative. I went over to his, his business. I sat down in his office and I said, listen, we haven't gotten off on a good foot and I don't want it to be this way. I want us to, to be friends and to get along. And he said, I don't want to be friends with you. And I don't want to get along with you. Get out of my store. So what do you do when people want to fight with you? Listen, don't fight back. Turn the other cheek. And we've been talking about this, right? Turn the other cheek. Go the second mile. Pray for those that are your enemies. You don't have to fight back. Mark Twain said, Never get down in the mud and wrestle with a pig. You both get dirty and the pig enjoys it. So you have people who want to fight with you and you're tempted to, to, to listen to how the, the, your flesh speaks, how your anger talks. You want to get down there and fight with them. That's what they want. And it never works out for the benefit of God's church or God's people. In a positive way, express your faith. In a positive way, you go on and live your life. And, and listen, this is really hard to do. God doesn't need you to fight his battles. He can fight them on his own. You trust God to take care of these things. And my experience has been is that God always takes care of his battles and always wins the victory. Don't fight with other believers. Now, Paul teaches instead to focus on yourself. Focus on yourself. Now, not become self-focused. That means that if you're self-focused, you see all the world revolving around you, and if there's a problem in the world and somebody else is doing it and it's not you, it's never your sin, it's always somebody else's sin. I'm getting ready to tell you a joke. And I want you to work really hard to get this joke. Sometimes I tell you a joke, I say, this joke isn't that funny, you know, and you humor me by laughing anyway. So you got to work on this. And it's a very funny joke. Listen. So this man thinks his wife is losing her hearing. So he decides to give her a test. He walks by the kitchen one day, she's washing dishes. And so he stands at the door and he says, that's a beautiful dress. Nothing. He walks halfway across the kitchen floor, says again, that's a beautiful dress. Nothing. Then he goes, stands right behind her and says loudly, that's a beautiful dress. And she turns around and said, I heard you the first two times. Oh, Shannon. <laughs> now, at the early service, they got this joke. They laughed like crazy. Okay, let me explain it. Let me explain it. The one who was deaf was not her. It was him. You got to work harder, friends. You got to work. So, you see, he was self-focused, right? We're not, me and my wife, we're not communicating so well. And who's at fault? She is because she's deaf. But really, all along, the problem was his. Most likely on Wednesday, you'll be sitting around the house and all of a sudden you'll start laughing. That's what's going to happen, you know? So I'm not talking about being, being self-focused. I'm talking about focusing on yourself. Here's what Paul said to Timothy. Do your best. Now, God saves us. It's all his work. It all, it's all his work. But he isn't like the good fairy, and he comes along with a magic wand, and he touches your head, and he says, everything has changed. Bing! And it all magically changes. He works in us when we work with him. That's why over and over in Scripture we're told things like, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. He's not talking about earn your salvation. He's saying, listen, you enjoy the benefits of salvation when with fear and trembling you recognize your sin and you work on it. Paul says the same thing here. Do your very best to present yourself to God as a workman approved. Now, what that means is this. Now, the word workman is a word taken out of the construction business. A, a, a carpenter who measures twice and cuts once. A, a bricklayer who learns how to put the plumb line down so that the wall is straight. And these days also use a level. Now, me personally, 
I can't do anything with my hands. Nothing. Zip. I, I worked construction one summer. My boss found out pretty quickly that the best thing I could do for them was carry. <laughs> that's what I did all summer long was carry stuff because I, I don't have that ability. My wife says I have minimal brain dysfunction, which means that when I was born, I had some oxygen cut off the part of my brain, and I lost the ability to use my hands. So, you know, all I can do is paint. I can't even hammer a nail. It's hilarious. <laughs> And so he says, the position of a, a work would approve. You know, I really groove on that because I have to work really, really hard to be able to use my hands. He says, listen, you take God's word and you do your best as a workman to use it in your life, to learn by it, to apply it to your life. You take the word and you use it. Listen, one of our cardinal ideas as, as, as believers, as evangelicals, is the idea of priesthood of the believer. Now, you don't hear that term very often, but let me explain it to you. It's very important. A priest is someone who stands between you and God and, and is a mediator for you. Now, you've got Jesus. He's your priest. I'm not a priest. Now, I, have, I hope I have the gift of preaching and of teaching. I hope I have that. And you can, be, you can benefit from those people who have the gifts of preaching and teaching, but you don't need people to tell you what to believe. You can stand in front of God yourself, open up His Word, and the Holy Spirit will lead you to the truth. And you say, well, you know, I don't read very well. Remember, I can't use my hands. I, so I understand some disabilities. You know, I don't read very well. Well, get an easy translation. I used the message a while ago, which is a tremendous help, a tool to understand God's work. It's such a simple, easy paraphrase. You know, our, our children use the New International Reader's Version. Have you heard them when they quote it? And they always, at the end, go, nerve. <laughs> I get a big kick out of that. You don't, you're not even listening to me, are you? Nerve. <sighs> oh, my. Well, you know, that, that, they're just, it's New International Readers where you say, they're, they, they could quote that. That's a really simple to use translation. I oftentimes will look at it to see a different way of looking at the verse. So you get an easy translation, and, and you spend five or ten minutes every day wrestling with part of God's Word, trying to understand what it means, using the best tools you have available, and then you get up from the table, from the chair, and you go out into the world, and you try to live what you learned that morning or the night before as you were struggling with God's Word. You do your best to be a workman approved, someone who can use God's Word in a correct and powerful way because you understand that God wants you to do your very best. You need to focus on yourself. What are my sins? What am I doing It's not in full compliance with God's Word? How do I have to change? What am I doing to cause problems in my life? It's not what other people are. It's what I am. I'm not going to look at them and blame them. I'm going to look at myself and try to improve and be the very best I can be. Now, one more thing, and I'm only going to spend just a moment on this. Your faith is more than just words. Avoid godless chatter. It's more than just words. Now, one of the, the, the perspectives I have gained being a pastor since 1979 is I, that unfortunately it breaks my heart, but I've seen people come into church and leave. I've seen them come and go. I see a, a, I've seen people come in and uh, they, they put on a big show of their faith. They talk with all the words, you know, of a Christian. They may even fall into the pattern of saying, hey man, hallelujah, brother, how you doing? They may have a Bible so big that they pull on a little red wagon behind them when they walk around. Have you known people like this? They talk a big talk, but it's not real. It's only talk. I like the spiritual. It says, some people go to church just to sing and shout, but after six weeks, they're all turned out. Now, what that means is they come and they talk a big game they talk big about their faith, but when, when life continues on and challenges their faith, they end up walking away because it was never more than talk. Hypocrisy talks. 
faith walks. So what you're doing when you try to do your best is you want to make sure that when you talk, it's not just a game. It's not just chatter. It's not just pretend. But your faith is real based on a life lived with God in parallel to His Word and with His power. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we're praying now that we won't be looking at other people as nails and we're the hammer. That we have to go through life having fight after fight to, 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 to make sure that we protect you when you can protect yourself. Instead, what Paul teaches is for us to, in a positive way, believe the truth and present the truth and depend on you for the rest. Now, our responsibility isn't the fight, but instead the love. Our focus should be on our own sin and on somebody else's. Not worry about the speck in our brother's eye when we have a, a big piece of timber hanging out of our own. Our focus should be on our sin and our growth and our place with you. May it never be bragging, but instead may it be fact. Now, there might be people who are here present, people watching online, who have never believed in Jesus, may they believe right now. And if you're that person, pray this prayer with me. Father, I know I'm a sinner. I know I've broken your laws and commands. I pray that you'll forgive me based on what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and that you'll come and live inside of me by the presence of the Holy Spirit that I might know that I'm saved. In Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer with me, let me know on the card you find in the chair. If you're online, let the online counselor know. If you pray that prayer, you're a believer, and we want to be in touch with you, share more with you about your growth in the faith. Now, Father, we leave this place in a moment. We pray as we leave that our focus will be on the gospel of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Oh.
Just so happy we get to do that, Lord. We thank you so much for our calling. Lord, may we go out of here loving each other, never putting any, any issue of life over the gospel and the Christian message. May we never lose the perspective that Jesus holds it all together and we love each other because of him and we turn our cheek to those who persecute us, who wrong us, who are mean to us, and we love them because they don't really know what they're doing. They don't know that when they hurt us, when they attack us, they're, they're really working against you, God, and your plans. May we be agents of love in our world, peace in our world, so they may see the great plan you have for them, God, through Jesus Christ. We pray in his name, amen.